Welcome to session number 66 in the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series. This is the eighth year. It's January 2023, and we are beginning by picking up a series which we started last year, looking at the first two books in Dan Simmons' Hyperion Cantos, Hyperion and the Fall of Hyperion. Now for this session, we are looking at the uh, last two books in the series, uh, Endymion and the Rise of Endymion, kind of some nice parallelism there between Rise and Fall. And these books are a little bit thicker than the others. They come in at around 600 and 700 pages, so a lot going on. And they they answer a lot of questions. They wrap up a lot of loose ends and introduce so many other threads of the narrative world that uh, Dan Simmons is, is creating that we're going to have a lot to, to discuss with this. Now, for those who are tuning in and not familiar with the Worlds of Speculative Fiction series is... We started this series back in 2016 as an in-person discussion and, you know, focusing on philosophical themes, authors, plots, characters, narrative universes. And it, it, it proved to be very successful and, uh, the people who were interested in it were quite engaged. It was hosted by the Brookfield Public Library here in the greater Milwaukee area. Then when we hit COVID in 2020, uh, 20, yeah, 20, we had to shift gears a little bit for a while. We weren't meeting at all. And then we moved to this sort of format where I present for about 90 minutes talking about these books and all the things that are going on in them. We do a live chat, which perhaps you might be participating in right now with a video premiere. And then we follow it up with about another 90 minutes or so of video conferencing using Zoom to have uh, a continued discussion of all the issues. So we are going to be digging into Endymion and Rise of Endymion. I actually found these to be just as interesting, enjoyable, engaging as the first two books, perhaps even more so for me in part because there are so many interesting philosophical themes, literally cosmic in scope, that uh, are worked out and gradually revealed in these two works. New characters are introduced, old characters are brought back in, some of them seemingly brought back to life that had died in the, we thought they died in the earlier works, and uh, there's so much interesting stuff going on. We don't need to do biography since we did that in the previous session. So we'll probably jump right in by looking at some of the things that Simmons himself says about these two volumes, some of the things that other people have had to say, positive and negative, and then we're going to get into the narrative universe that is, you know, originally introduced here and then is further developed in the second two, uh, the, the third and fourth book of these Hyperion Cantos. I will mention one other thing, which we're going to talk about at greater length. The Hyperion Cantos, the series, are these four books. But the Hyperion Cantos is also a text discussed and referenced in these two books. So there's a little bit of meta going on there. I don't want to talk about that too long, though, so let's jump now into looking at what Simmons himself has to tell us about these uh, these books and the series as a whole that you might find, hopefully, as interesting as I do. 
Given the amount of space, or rather time, that we devoted to looking at the interviews that Dan Simmons has given about Hyperion, its characters, its plot, artificial intelligence, all those sorts of things, in the previous session, I don't think we need to go back over that again. And I think it could be useful just to focus primarily on some reviews, and many of them are quite critical of these uh, third and fourth books within the Cantos. I think that some of the reviews are off in certain places, and we'll, we'll talk about that. I do want to bring up one thing from Simmons that he said in Locus in an interview, and this will be the only interview bit. He says that the rise of Endymion is absolutely the last of the Hyperion books. He says also it's not the absolutely last thing I'm going to write. I'm going to write a little novelette, but it is the last novel. Sometimes it's a dirty trick when a writer continues a tale and you find out there were unreliable narrators or something that seemed to be told in all candor actually wasn't as it appeared. That irritates me sometimes when I read, but I did that in the fall of Hyperion. Some of the things in Hyperion were not as first perceived, and I have to say in The Rise of Endymion, there is more of that. Not in the sense of a trick, I hope, but in the sense of finally getting a clear perspective on what was going on in the preceding three books. And I think that we can say that that also happens in Endymion itself. We learn more about the architecture of the universe and what's going on with the autonomous intelligences in the techno core and the Firecaster Network and the Void That Binds and things like that. But he is right. There's a lot more in The Rise of Endymion that is being revealed through all of these dialogues, discussions, plot points. And so that's, that's quite important. And I think, I think there's a distinction there that's quite significant. So he says that I'm not going to write some more novels after these and make use of the unreliable narrator or, you know, I'm just joking here. It was all a dream and here's the real reality or something like that. This is it. This is the end of the Hyperion Cantos. But um, there is going to be a lot of additional revelation that has to happen along the way. And the question that we should ask, because some of the people accuse him of doing retconning, is... Is that really the appropriate idea or is it more the traditional, you know, uh, I won't say trope or technique, but impulse to reveal more and more and more of reality that does fit cohesively together as we go on. So that's worth keeping in mind. So I, I really only have three authors for reviews, but three authors that I'm going to bring up. So um, in the New York Times review, Ger uh, Gerald Jonas says, for vastness of scope, clarity of detail, and seriousness of purpose, Simmons' epic narrative is on a par with Isaac Asimov's Foundation series, Frank Herbert's Dune books, Gene Wolfe's multi-part Book of the New Sun, and Brian Aldiss's Heliconia trilogy. No one in modern science fiction, not even Wolfe, has dealt more sensitively with the interface between religion and science, yet the rise of Endymion, like its three predecessors, is also a full-blooded action novel replete with personal combats in battles in space that are distinguished from formulaic space opera by the magnitude of what is at stake, which is nothing less than the salvation of the human soul. So let's pause on that for a moment. There's, there's a lot in that first paragraph that I think is quite right. So there is space opera elements in this, right? There's the, you know, we could call it travel narrative, going through these far casters from world to world to world. I mean, sort of redolent in some parts of Philip Jose Farmer's World of Tears, um, you know, where you, where you go through these portals and it's kind of a cool plot device allowing you to overcome the distance between worlds. And, um, you know, there is the let's shoot them up out in space, cool stuff going on. But 
um, this is right, that all of that stuff is happening within the framework of a bigger story that has to do with the, the purpose, the ends, the development of humanity in relation, not just to its own uh, one-time creations, although they've gone on their own, the you know, autonomous intelligences, uh, but also others as well. You know, it's a cosmos that we inhabit with other races. Now, is it on a par with Isaac Asimov's Foundation series? I would actually say this is way better than the Foundation series. And, and you know, it's aided by the fact that the Foundation series, at least the original ones, are not very long, you know, compared to what's going on in, in these works. Um, the Dune Okay, Dune begins with a really, really amazing, great first novel. And then, you know, it's good, but not absolutely outstanding the rest of the developments. And, you know, there is this great theme of where is human, humanity going. I'm willing to say that the Hyperion Cantos is actually, on the whole, better than the Dune series. Uh, at least the stuff that Frank Herbert himself wrote, not to mention the stuff that his, his son writes afterwards. Um, Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun. Okay, now I think we're in the same territory. I think we could say that R. Scott Backer's works. I think that we could say uh, C.J. C.H. Chera's Alliance Union Universe, which of course has many other books um, and which we get to see revealed over, over time as well. Um, those are maybe the peers for this this uh, set of novels, really, as, as um, Simmons has said, two big novels, each of which is in two books. So this is the second novel in the third and fourth book. All right, so going on with uh, Jonas's review. In reviewing the first two books in the series, Hyperion and Sequel to Fall of Hyperion, I noted that they actually constituted a single thousand page novel that should be read from the beginning. This is, you know, the same and um, I'm not sure how comprehensible they would be to readers unfamiliar with the rest of the series, but taken together, the four volumes represent one of the finest achievements of modern science fiction, a convincing demonstration of how liberating in the hands of a masterly practitioner genre conventions can be. I think that's a good point as well. So Simmons is working with a lot of different, we could call them subgenres, and weaving them in together and making use of them. So, I mean, to be fair to Asimov and Herbert and others before, maybe we could say, well, without them coming before, no Simmons later on. But there's, there's a, uh, certainly a leap in quality here. Uh, he says, in previous books of this series, Simmons alternates between impassioned discussions of moral issues and scenes of action rendered with an agonizing slow motion precision. He takes the reader to planets and habitats of lavish complexity and agreeable strangeness. Even when the arena shifts to the metaphysical, Endymion's ingrained distaste for rhetoric keeps the language lean and grounded. At his best, Simmons knows how to light up a faded conceit. Uh, the story of Aena and her mission involves so many mysteries within mysteries that just when you begin to think Simmons cannot possibly remember, let alone untangle them, he reveals how neatly they all fit together in the service of his overarching theme, which is that prolonging life is less important than enriching life, and a merely physical immortality is just another kind of death. So again, let's uh, take a pause for a second. Important distinction that goes all the way back to ancient political theory between Zain, living, life, and Toyu Zain, living well, which somebody like Aristotle takes to be possible really only within the scope of a community, at least for human beings who are neither animals nor gods, but somewhere in between. And I think that really is a central theme to these works. Survival of the species, survival in terms of maintaining power structures that are gonna give the human race an order and a, uh, a direction versus you know, the capacity for 
autonomous self-determination and discovery in relation to others. How are these supposed to work together? Humanity itself is divided into the ousters along with um, the Templars, you know, who were originally in the hegemony and then, you know, are now with the ousters and the Pax and the church, um, you know, from the hegemony and then, you know, the, the techno core, which is itself divided into a whole bunch of things. So that, that's enough to draw out of that review. Uh, another interesting one is not another feminist science fiction review of the Hyperion Cantos by Barbara Gurgle, which I partly agree with and partly disagree with. Um, she talks about the series and she does a little bit of, you know, summary, which could be useful for those who haven't actually read everything. So I'm going to read what she has to say because it might be useful for some of you. Hyperion tells the story of the Selvan pilgrims and their lives and their individual encounters with the Shrike. We meet Father Leonard Hoyt, a priest of the nearly defunct Catholic Church, Fademan Kassad, a retired corporal with a reputation for ruthlessness, Braun Lamia, a female private eye who's in love with a cyborg reincarnation of the 18th century English poet John Keats and who appears to have stepped directly out of a noir detective novel complete with trench coat and six shooter. Saul Weintraub, a religious scholar who is bringing his infant daughter Rachel to Hyperion in an attempt to cure her Merlin's disease, which causes her to age backwards. Martin Selenus, an aged and lecherous poet born centuries earlier on Old Earth and kept alive through a mixture of hyperspeed fugue, fugue and wealth. Het Mastin, a Templar priest who commands a starship that's actually a tree. And the council, a state agent and former governor of the city of Cates on the fam planet Hyperion, who has been asked by Gladstone the CEO of the hegemony to attend the pilgrimage due to reports of an ouster spy among them. In each of their stories, they tell how they first encountered the Shrike, what led them to embark on this pilgrimage. Now they travel to the apparent home of the Shrike, the time tombs, a series of tunnels that travel backwards through time to either make a wish or to attempt to kill it. And Dimian leaps forward more than 200 years to tell the story of the daughter of Braun, Lamia, and the first cyborg, Cates. This trial is actually the physical manifestation of empathy, part of the trinity of God that mankind creates in the distant future as part of their war against the Technocore's own God, the ultimate intelligence. The rise of Endymion brings to fruition the burgeoning collaboration between the newly revived Catholic Church and the Technocore that we see at the end of the fall of Hyperion and Endymion. And Lamia's human AI child, Ayana, has amassed a cult following due to her threat to the Pax, current Catholic intergalactic government. Somehow the time-traveling AI god baby is not the most confusing or highly criticized aspect of this series. And then she starts talking about criticism. So this is some good summary. Now here's, here's some of the criticisms. The prevailing criticism of the series is not simply that the latter three books are not as good as the first. A more accurate characterization would be that the main problem present in books two through four is also present in book one, though to a lesser extent. Book one is just good enough for readers to overlook the sexism. These aren't new problems, as could be explained by countless feminist science fiction and fantasy writers, and so she's going to go into that. Now, we should pause for a second. Is it really the case that um, book one is the really standout great book and then these other three books that come afterwards, uh, Fall of Hyperion, Endymion, and The Rise of Endymion are just not as good and more flawed? Yeah, there, there's some criticisms out there. The question is, are the criticisms valid or true? or on point. I think they're not. I, I think uh, that the series actually, Hyperion sets a high standard and the other three novels um, manage to follow it up. It's not like Dune where the first one is really the best and the others are good, but and they're filling in pictures, but they're just not as good. I don't think that's the case at all. Now she talks about sexism. And this is where it gets quite interesting, I think. So she says, she's going to admit that Simmons is actually getting around other ways of being sexist, and then she'll accuse him of a different sort. <clears throat> so she says, 
The series contends with its own flavor of sexism, perhaps more subtle in some respects than, say, the dearth of female characters in Tolkien's writing. We do, in fact, see many female characters in the Hyperion series. So, you know, good admission there. Um, the CEO... Uh, not only do women exist in Simmons' world, but they're often powerful. The CEO of the intergalactic human community is a woman, or more accurately, a Thatcher slash Merkel slash Clinton amalgamated archetype in a power suit. The lone female pilgrim is a muscle-bound, powerful detective that at one point kills a man with her thighs. Cassad's greatest nemesis is a former lover named Moneta, who helps him slaughter thousands of ousters and later rapes him while they're covered with the blood of their enemies and might be the Shrike. And, you know, the new messiah in books three and four is Lamia's grown daughter, who is often very worried about the delicate feelings of her older boyfriend. All these characters get basically one big important thing to do and then later recede into decorative lamps in the background. The tough as nails but per pregnant detective who can lift men by the collar later ends up sleeping with the lecherous old poet who hates her and at one point had himself gene spliced into a satyr. You get the picture. It's not simply the treatment of the lady characters that give the aura of misogyny. Um, knowing sci-fi and fantasy lack female characters, Simmons includes a lot of them. Knowing that the genre writes women simply as objects of men's desire, he writes undesirable women. Knowing that slaying the dragon is traditionally a job for men, Simmons makes his slayers and his dragon as free female. But bucking known tropes for the heck of it while failing to address the deep undercurrent of misogyny in an entire series does not lead to a much better outcome. Now here's where we can see uh, an interesting criticism being made. All these admissions, yeah, he did this and this and this and this, and you can say, so that's not enough for for you as the critic. He is actually very thoughtfully uh, developing characters who aren't just one-trick ponies. I don't think that Lamia is. I don't think that Gladstone is. Um, I don't think that Aina is by any stretch. Um, and even um, Moneta, who turns out to be Rachel, uh, I don't think that that fits with her. And there are other characters as well who, who show up playing a, a significant role. Um, she claims that the misogyny is that female characters are vastly outnumbered than those that do exist are boring. The Messiah character is young and sexy yet innocent. There's a female assassin who's deadly but sexy and vulnerable. The leader of mankind is once again a man, a priest no less. Even the genderless android is coded as male. Um, books three and four are entirely about Hyena. The AI god baby is fighting the packs for the soul of mankind. The books are named after Raoul Endymion, a blundering hunting guide who comes completely undone when he learns that during a two-year separation between him and Aina, she has sex with another man who later turns out to be him from the future. It's, you know, so it, it goes on as well. So we should think about this. Is this a fair criticism? Um, I mean, I have to leave that to the readers to decide whether, you know, Aina is really this kind of insipid stock character or whether she's quite dynamic. I, I read it as, as that. I mean, she, and you know, why is it told through the eyes of Raul and Demian and also, you know, Captain De Soda? Um, well, Raul tells you that <laughs> later on in the story. Uh, and I, I kind of think that um, maybe the critic here forgot about that. Um, you know, it, it turns out that he's not actually her protector. He's actually sort of her recorder. So she's in a much greater position than, than he is. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's, that's worth thinking about. Um, she goes on and says, In Hyperion, the sexism is redeemed by the format of the storytelling, the deep and intricate world building, and interesting and dynamic characters. Um, I've recommended Hyperion to everyone who likes science fiction. It was the love of the first book that kept me reading through three more. Even though they were frankly not good, Hyperion's questions are clumsily answered in the other three books. I don't know. I, 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 I don't really buy that myself. This seems like a kind of reading that missed some of what was going on in part so it could focus in on a sexism that perhaps is there, perhaps not. You know, and I'd like to know how things could be undone structurally in this. And maybe the point of comparison would be to C.J. Chera's 
Alliance Union universe, you know. Um, but that would, that would require some additional work. Now, I do have one other review that I wanted to bring up, or set of reviews, rather, both by Russ Albury. So he reviews first Endymion and then reviews the rise of Endymion. And he says, Endymion is the weakest book in the Hyperion series. While some hooks were left for a sequel, Endymion feels a little bit bolted on at times and Simmons engages in some retconning, retroactively changing or reinterpreting the past story. It's also a less interesting story. It doesn't have the storytelling brilliance of Hyperion or the space opera sweep of the fall of Hyperion and sometimes feels boring or pointless. It's mostly a travelogue. How much you enjoy the book is likely to have a lot to do with how interesting you find the exploration of worlds of the old hegemony. So let's pause there. I, I mean, I didn't find it um, boring at all, and I didn't find it to be lacking the storytelling brilliance or space opera sweep. Um, I mean, I will admit that I think he is on to something, the jumping between worlds travelogue thing. I also found that a little bit, you know, um, after a while dull in, I've already brought up the, you know, uh, farmer's world of tears when they go from world to world to world. Um, but that's not all that's going on in these explorations. So I, I think that um, Albury might have lost the point of what, what else is happening, right? He says, there's a larger plot, though. Endymion introduces the Pax, the new government that's taken over after the conclusion of the fall of Hyperion, and now dominates mankind far more than the hegemony did, Right? Half the book is told from the perspective of Raoul and Demian, the other half from the perspective of the priest of the Pax, who is chasing Raoul and Aena. And the Pax sections, I thought, were the strongest in the book. Okay, there's, there's something there, right? Uh, exploring a uh, religious, rotten, full of potential, not being realized, but being crushed organization that has become essentially the evil empire. Uh, yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot to be worked with there. Um, he, uh, he winds up saying, much of the trouble with Endymion is that it's a bridge book. It's trying to take the world of a mostly completed space opera story and prepare it as a backdrop in which to tell a very different story about religion, belief, and messiahs. Accordingly, it's neither fish nor fowl and ends up feeling occasionally forced, leaves one with the feeling that not a lot really happened. The rise of Endymion is the real payoff to this story, and Endymion serves primarily to get the reader to the point where the story can be told. I think that's wrong. Um, there's a lot that goes on within the story, not just world building, not just character development, not just retconning, as, as he's calling it, which you know is better understood as like revealing more of the dimensions that, that were there, uh, just waiting to be uncovered. And, uh, you know, so... I think that um, it is it is a bridge book in a sense, but that doesn't have to lower it in quality. A bridge can be constructed shoddily or a bridge can be constructed well. And I think that in this case, it is really constructed well. And the idea that nothing happens, I mean, the Shrike is revealed to be not just this enemy of humankind, but actually protecting Aena and escapes its its boundaries. The uh, fact of, you know, the resurrection uh, cruciform or parasite uh, being used in particular ships where these poor bastards have to die and be resurrected over and over again. The introduction of, you know, the sort of uh, amped up terminators coming from the machine corps who are trying to kill um, Aena and anybody else connected with her. And then the turning of the Pax crew with Father DeSoto, attacking that very being, saving uh, Aena and Raul and, and, you know, Betnik and all the others from that. I mean, this is, um, this is some real action here. It's not like nothing does happen in Endymion. Uh, he continues with another review. The rise of Endymion completes the transition started in Endymion and takes the story of the Hyperion universe in a very different direction. 
This is not a story about interstellar governments or space battles, although both do feature in it. It's the gospel of a messiah of empathetic humanism set against the backdrop of a space opera universe. I, I think that's actually right. I think that um, that's a good characterization of what's happening in these, and particularly Endymion, uh, Rise of Endymion. I think it's there in Endymion itself. Um, and so, you know, he goes on, Aina's philosophy focuses on individuals and their relationships, on trust, communities, forgiveness, redemption, and nonviolent resistance. Instead of violence, it focuses on love and more broadly on connections between people, on fostering and creating life. Now, that's going a little too far. There is fighting. There is defending. There is attacking. You know, uh, the Shrike plays a very important role, as does Kassad who becomes the Shrike, by the way. But yeah, that's, that's largely right. There's, there's something that's been missing on the part of some of the humans and some of the AIs that Aena is able to bring to the human race spread out through the, the cosmos. Um, so he, he goes on and he says, the story is told in the form of a gospel, a first-person account written by her companion and lover, and Catholic and Christian imagery is used extensively throughout. The traditional form of church rituals are a centerpiece of the Pax Church, which lays claim to Catholic tradition, while underneath is an exercise in cynical technology. Aena's rituals are superficially ways of interacting with physical laws and science, but take on the form of those same Christian rituals, redeeming them for something closer to their spiritual purpose. Okay, that is true. And uh, Buddhism plays a role, and... Other things play a role as well. It's not just Catholic and Christian. And he goes on, he says, I can come up with many reasons why someone would dislike this book. The retconning is blatant at times. It depends on what you consider retconning, right? If, if that's a killer for you, then probably it's not a good book. 200 pages could have been trimmed uh, from the book. I never did understand the point of the geography tour and list of names on Tian Shan. Uh, that that's more i would say admitting that one doesn't get why parts of the story are in there parts of it meander badly the technology and physics are often frankly unbelievable and the viewpoint character can be quite stupid at times maybe the viewpoint character is actually supposed to be quite stupid you know maybe that's part of why he's in the place that he's in then he goes on and he says and yet i love this book Aina is one of my favorite fictional characters, and that's an amazing feat for a character who is cast in the role of Messiah, carrying with it both foreknowledge and near infallibility, which she doesn't actually have. She can see futures, but she's not sure which is going to be which. Uh, throughout the story, she exudes an enthusiastic joy and love of life that's infectious and delightful to read. She also has the two, best two-word mission statement of any religious figure I've read about, Here's a really interesting observation, and this is where we get to the end of the reviews. This book reminds me of what Star Wars could be if it had more fully developed a humanist philosophy around the Force and explored the implications for the universe of something like the Force existing. There's a space opera plot over underlying mysticism, lush world building focusing on images and impressions rather than geology and planetary physics, and odd cultures tucked into the corners of the galaxy. Um, the ending, though, put Star Wars to shame, even knowing exactly what was coming, this being my second reading. This is an important uh, criterion. I love the twists and emotional climax of it. Can the books, can the, the composition, the narrative universe, profit from a second reading? That is what makes things classics. You know, the fact that you can go back to them and find more and more and more in them. So these are some, uh, you know, we went through some reviews. We've already revealed some of what's going on in these. Now we got to talk about some of the world building that's uh, happening in here. Some of the, let's call it retconning if people want, but let's also call it revelation. And the key philosophical themes that we find in these two novels. There are so many incredible philosophical themes woven into Endymion and the rise of Endymion and spanning this entire set of works that we call the Hyperion Cantos, that it's rather difficult to decide where to go in, where to start. And so I thought that 
arbitrarily, one of the best places that we might begin is with the notion of the cantos themselves and what that's supposed to mean. So what we've got here is a bit of recursivity, or if you like, you know, the work itself is included in the work or referenced within the work, which by itself is an interesting idea. And so you could think of the Hyperion Cantos as the production of Martin Selenius uh, that covers what happens in these first two books. And that is indeed largely correct, but we're going to find out by the very end that the Cantos were never finished, but they're able to be finished. And the Cantos themselves are connected up with the this figure, um, you know, our, our main point of view character of Raoul Endymion, the Endymion that this is named after, right? But he's not really, in, in many respects, the main character. The most important character is Aina, um, who he is charged with protecting. And we'll talk about that in just a bit and all the things that she's going to learn and teach and uh, project out onto humankind. Um, it's, you know, there's also uh, De Soya, the priest captain, who uh, things are told in a, uh, a third person for him. And uh, we begin, and essentially we end, with Raoul stuck in a prison cell and then eventually getting out of it. So the, the whole story begins like this, which is kind of a rather enigmatic idea. You are reading this for the wrong reason. So this is at the very beginning of the, the third book. If you are reading this to learn what it was like to make love to a Messiah, our Messiah, then you should not read on because you are little more than a voyeur. Now, I say, it never occurred to me to, to read for that reason. You just kind of put that in my head. He goes on, if you're reading this because you're a fan of the old poet's cantos and are obsessed with curiosity about what happened next in the lives of the Hyperion pilgrims, you will be disappointed. I do not know what happened to most of them. They lived and died almost three centuries before I was born. Now, most of them, yes, technically speaking, but we are going to see some of those who we thought dead coming back. If you're reading this because you seek more insight into the message from the one who teaches, you may also be disappointed. I confess that I was more interested in her as a woman than as a teacher or a messiah. Not quite true. Finally, if you're reading this to discover her fate or even my fate, you're reading the wrong document. Although both of our fates seem as certain as anyone's could be, I was not with her when hers was played out, and my own awaits the final act even as I write these words. Not quite true either. If you're reading this at all, I would be amazed, but this would not be the first time that events have amazed me. The past few years have been one improbability after another, each more marvelous and seemingly inevitable than the last. To share the memories is the reason I am writing. Perhaps the motivation is not even to share, knowing that the document I am creating almost certainly will never be found, but just to put down the series of events so I can structure them in my own mind, kind of a you know, message in a bottle, getting my own thoughts clear. And of course, we did get his, his thoughts because they're spanning all of these books, right? And he says, um, I am writing this in a Schrodinger cat box in high orbit around the quarantine world of Armagast. The cat box is not much of a box, more of a smooth hulled ovoid, a mere six meters by three meters. It will be my entire world until the end of my life. Most of the interior of my world is a Spartan cell consisting of a black box air and waste recycler, my bunk, the food synthesizer unit, a narrow counter that serves as both my writing table and writing desk, and finally the toilet, sink, and shower, which are set behind a fiber plastic partition for reasons of propriety that escape me. No one will ever visit me here. Privacy seems a hollow joke. I have a tech slate and stylus. When I finish each page, I transfer it to hard copy on micro vellum produced by the recycler. The low accretion of wafer thin pages is the only visible change in my environment from day to day. The vial of poison gas is not visible. 
It is set in the static dynamic shell of the cat box linked to the air filtration unit in such a way that to attempt to fiddle with it would trigger the cyanide as would any attempt to breach the shell itself. The radiation detector, its timer, and the isotope element are also fused into the frozen energy of the shell. I never know when the random timer activates the detector. I never know when the same random timing element opens the lead shielding to the tiny isotope. I never know when the isotope yields a particle, but I will know when the detector is activated at the instant the isotope yields a particle. There should be the scent of bitter almonds in that second or two before the gas kills me. Right? And he says, technically, according to the ancient enigma of quantum physics, I am now neither dead nor alive. I am in the suspended state of overlapping probability waves once reserved for the cat in Schrodinger's thought experiment. And so this is, you know, quite an interesting start. It's sort of like, you know, it's a trope at this point. You know, you could, might think of the movie DOA, where a, a person walks into a police station and says, I want to report a murder. They say, whose? And he's, he says, mine, right? He's going to die. And it's, uh, interestingly, from radiation. Um, then he recounts his story. And that is what we're getting through most of this. And we even have vignettes where he, in Rise of Endymion, where he's in the cell, right? We learn about that. But first, we have to come back to the cantos themselves. So in the story, Raul is on Hyperion, the you know, place where all of this took place. Well, most of which took place uh, in those earlier books. And uh, he's sentenced to death because of a, a, a mishap with a bunch of rich jerks who he has to lead on a hunting expedition. And he's saved from the execution. Uh, people think he is executed. And then he's brought to uh, our character, Martin Salinas. So we have this vignette. The old man said, you can run an errand for me and become rich. Tell me, I said. The old man closed his eyes and rattled in a deep breath. Can you read Raul and Dimian? Yes. Have you read the poem known as the Cantos? No. But you've heard some of it. Surely being born into one of the nomadic shepherd clans of the north, the storyteller is touched on the Cantos. There was a strange tone in the cracked voice, modesty perhaps. I've heard bits of it. My clan preferred the Garden Epic or the Glen and Height Saga. The sadder figures crease into a smile. The Garden Epic, yes. Raoul was a centaur hero in that, was, was he not? I said nothing. Grand Ammon loved the character of the centaur named Raoul. My mother and I had both grown up listening to tales of him. Do you believe the stories, snapped the old man, the Cantos tales, I mean. Believe them, I said, that they actually happened that way, the pilgrims and the Shrike and all that. I paused a minute. There were those who believed all the tall tales told in the cantos, and there were those who believed none of it, that it was all myth and maundering thrown together to add mystery to the ugly war and confusion that was the fall. I never really thought about it, I said truthfully. Does it matter? The old man seemed to be choking, but then I realized the dry, rattling sounds were chuckles. Not really, he said at last. Now listen, I will tell you the outline of the errand. It takes energy for me to speak. Uh, so he tells him, my story begins almost 270 some years ago during the fall. One of the pilgrims in the Cantos was a friend of mine. Her name was Braun Lamia. She was real. After the fall, after the death of the hegemony and the opening of the time tombs, Braun Lamia gave birth to a daughter. The child's name was Diana, but the little girl was headstrong and changed her name almost as soon as she was able to talk. For a while, she was known as Cynthia, then Kate, short for Hecate. Then when she turned 12, she insisted that her friends and family call her Temis. When I last saw her, she was called Aena. Um, the old man stopped and squinted at me. If you think this is not important, you think this is not important, but names are important. If you had not been named after this city, which in turn named after an ancient poem, you would not have come to my attention and you would not be here today. You would be dead. Do you understand Raoul and Demian? No, I said, he shook his head. It doesn't matter. Where was I? The last time you saw the child, she called herself Aina. Yes, she was not an especially attractive child, but she was unique. Everyone who knew her felt she was different, special, not spoiled, despite all the nonsense with the name changes, just different. 
have you ever met someone who is profoundly different, Raul and Demian? And he goes on as well. Um, and he says, of course, Braun knew the child was special before she was born. He stopped and opened his eyes enough to squint at me. You've heard this part of the, can the cantos. Yes, I said. It was foretold by a cybrid entity that the woman named Lamia was to give birth to a child known as the One Who Teaches. I thought that the old man was going to spit. A stupid title. No one called Aina during the time I knew her. She was simply a child, brilliant and headstrong, but a child. Everything that was unique was unique only in potential. But then, Braun Lamia died, and Aina disappeared. She was 12. Technically, I was her guardian but she did not ask my permission to disappear. One day she left and I never heard from her again. I never heard from her, but I know where she went and where she will reappear. The time tombs are off limits now, but do you remember the names and functions of the tombs, Raoul and Demian? And they go on as well, and they talk about what's going to be his mission. So, He's asked, do you remember where the Sphinx led, boy? According to the Cantos, I said, Saul Weintraub and his daughter traveled to the distant future through the Sphinx. Yes, whispered the ancient thing in the hover bed. Saul and Rachel and a few others disappeared into the Sphinx before the pack sealed it and closed off the Valley of the Time Tombs. Many tried in those early days, tried to find a shortcut to the future, but the Sphinx seemed to choose who might travel through its tunnel in time. And then... Uh, Selena says, do you know what I'm going to ask of you? And Raul says, no, although again, I had a strong suspicion. I want you to go after Maena. I want you to find her, to protect her from the packs, to flee with her. And when she has grown up and become what she must become, to give her a message. I want you to tell her her uncle Martin is dying. And if she wishes to speak to him again, she must come home. And so, you know, this is setting things up. He also says, uh, I've got some other things I want you to do. You're going to have to protect her from the packs. You're going to have to do all these other uh, things as well. You're going to have to undo the uh, packs and the church and uh, figure out what the AI Technocore is up to. And Raul's like, oh, well, anything else you want with that? But that is the, the core of the story. Um, he's also telling him, you're going to travel the river Tethys. Now, the river Tethys was in these books, a series of rivers on over, I believe, 200 worlds throughout the hegemony, connected together by Farcaster portals, which allowed instant teleportation from one river on one planet to another. And so you could sail down this entire river traveling throughout space uh, all over these different worlds. And so that is uh, described in the Cantos, and that's what's going to be happening. Now, they, going on a little bit further, this is in um, with Father Captain Federico de Soya, um, and it's talking about church history and the Cantos. Both accounts, church history and the forbidden cantos, the church of the time has outlawed reading of it. But many people within the church do, in fact, read it because it's forbidden and because it might reveal information. Both accounts agreed it had been Father Duray, who, during his exile on the outback world of Hyperion, who discovered the symbiote called the cruciform. And we're going to talk more about that in just a bit. There, the histories had diverged beyond reconciliation. According to the poem, Duray had received the cruciform from the alien creature called the Shrike. According to the church's teachings, the Shrike, a representation of Satan, if there ever was one, had nothing to do with the discovery of the cruciform, but had later tempted both Father Duray and Father Hoyt. The church's history reported only Duray had succumbed to the creature's treachery. The cantos told in their confused mix of pagan mythology and garbled history how Duray had crucified himself in the flame force of Hyperion's pinion plateau rather than return the cruciform to the church. According to the pagan poet Martin Solenus, this was to save the church from reliance on a parasite uh, in place of faith. According to church history, 
which DeSoya believed Dure had crucified himself to end the pain the symbiote caused him, and in alliance with the Shrike demon to prevent the church, which Dure considered his enemy after having excommunicated him, from regaining its, vi its vitality through the discovery of the sacrament of resurrection. So what we see here is that the cantos are very important for providing a counter-narrative to the church's revisionist teachings about history. Uh, we get to see some other discussion of the cantos coming up uh, in something that we'll have to go back to in a bit, the, what's going on with the techno core. So uh, Aina and Raul are talking and uh, he says, or uh, uh, she says, did Uncle Martin's poem explain the motivations of these three important factions within the Technocore, the Stables, Volatiles, and Ultimates? And he says, more or less, it's hard to follow. The poem has Uman and the other core AI speaking in Zen Cohen's. Anna nodded, that's about right. According to the Cantos, I said, the group of core AIs known as the Stables wanted to keep being parasites on our human brains. The Volatiles wanted to wipe us out. and The Ultimates didn't give much of a damn as long as they could keep working on their machine god. So this is, you know, an important reference to it. And then here's another key idea coming up. Not all the far Farcaster portals were built or maintained by the Stables to be, how did you put it, like big ticks on our brains? All right. I said, well, who built the Farcasters? Who else built the Farcasters? The River Tethes Farcasters were designed by the Ultimates, said Aina. They were an experiment, I guess you could say, with the void which binds. That's the core phrase. Did Martin use it in his cantos? Yeah, I said. Um, I never understood what the hell the void which binds was supposed to be, I said. Some sort of hyperspace stuff that the Farcasters used and where the core was hiding when it preyed on us. I got that part. I thought it was destroyed when Mana Gladstone ordered bombs dropped into the Farcasters. You can't destroy the void which binds, said Aena. And then she says, how did Martin describe it? Plank time and plank length, I said. I don't remember exactly. Something about, about combining the three fundamental constants of physics. Gravity's plank's constant in the speed of light. That doesn't really tell me much. And um, you know, so the, this, this important metaphysical concept is contained in the cantos, but only partially. Uh, we're going to see a little bit later on um, it getting brought up again. So Aena says... Uh, I understand that the Cantos was placed on the index of pro prohibited books as soon as the Pax took over everywhere, but what about those worlds not yet swallowed by the Pax when it came out? Did he receive the critical acclaim he had been hungry for? I remember arguing the Cantos in seminary, chuckled Father Glaucus. We knew it was prohibited, but that just made the allure all the greater. We resisted reading Virgil, but waited our turn to read that dog-eared copy of Dog Roll that was the Cantos. Was it dog roll? asked Aina. I always thought of Uncle Martin as a great poet, but that's only because he told me he was. My mother always told me he was a pain in the ass. Poets can be both, said Father Glaucus. In fact, it seems they often are both. As I remember it, most of the critics dismissed the cantos in what few literary circles existed before the church absorbed them. Some took him seriously as a poet not as a chronicler of what actually happened on Hyperion before the fall, but most made fun of his apotheosis of love towards the end of his second volume. I remember that, I said. The character is Saul, the old scholar whose daughter has been aging backwards. He discovers that love was the answer to what he had called the Abraham Dilemma. I remember one nasty critic who reviewed the poem in our capital city, chuckled Father Glaucus, who quoted some graffiti found on the wall of an excavated old earth city before the Hegira. If love is the answer, what was the question? Aina looked at me in, for an explanation. In the cantos, I said, the scholar character seems to discover that the thing the AI core had called the void which binds is love. That love is a basic force of the universe, like gravity and electromagnetism, like strong and weak nuclear force. In the poem, Saul sees that the core ultimate intelligence will never be capable of understanding that empathy is inseparable from that source, from love. 
The old poet described love as the subquantum impossibility that carried information from photon to photon. Teilhard, meaning Teilhard de Chardin, would not have disagreed, said Father Glaucus, although he would have phrased it differently. Anyway, I said, the almost universal reaction to the poem, according to Grandam, was that it was weakened by this sentimentality. Aina was shaking her head. Uncle Martin was right. Love is one of the basic forces of the universe. I know that Saul Weintraub really believed he had discovered that. He said as much to Mother before he and his daughter disappeared into the Sphinx, riding it to the child's future. So, this is very interesting, is it not? The Cantos, and, you know, both these books and the Cantos within it, is articulating a vision of the cosmos, not just a history, not just a tale, that places love as central, as underlying everything. And it's dismissed because of that, including by the very church that claims that God is love and doesn't really exemplify it in many respects, except in certain characters. Now, towards the end of the rise of Endymion, we're going to get some more interesting discussions of the cantos. So one of the things that we discover, and this is through a memory, a listening to the voices of the dead that Raoul Endymion experiences while in the Schrodinger cage. He's recalling his mother's memories. And they're talking first about, you know, the, um, the packs coming in and the cruciform, which we'll get to in, in a bit because it's quite important. Here's the important part here. Remember when Raoul was telling uh, Martin Salinas, hey, I mean, I, I heard the cantos. I didn't really listen to them that much. I like this other stuff better. Well, that's not quite the case. So Grandam, right? Uh, his, his grandmother and the mother of this, this uh, his mother who, who is talking, uh, uh, Caltron and Demian. She says... Uh, the grandmother says, you don't have to worry about that. I still remember how to raise a young one. I still have tales to tell and skills to teach, and I will keep your memory alive in him. Grandam is squeezing my hand. The young remember most deeply when we are old and failing. It is the memories of childhood which can be summoned most clearly. And she goes on and she says, do you remember the voice, the verse of Rio Khan I taught you when you were barely older than Raoul. I have to laugh. You taught me dozens of Rio Khan verses, Grandam, the first one. And so she recites it. You used to like that verse, Caltron. And she goes on and talks about how she's going to take care of Raoul. And one of the ways she takes care of him, as we find out in The Rise of Endymion, is having him memorize the cantos. So Raoul actually does know the cantos, the cantos up to a certain point. And here's where we get what we could call the big reveal. So he is in his cell. This is in chapter 32 towards the end. And he says, there was neither clock nor calendar in my cell. I do not know how many standard days, weeks, or months I was beyond the reach of sanity. I may have gone many days without sleeping or slept without weeks on end. It is difficult or impossible to tell. But eventually, when the cyanide and the laws of quantum chance continue to spare me from day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, I began this narrative. The narrative that is the point of view character stuff in these two books, parts of the Hyperion Cantos. I do not know why my imprisoners provided me with a slate text scriber and stylus and the ability to print a few pages of recycled microvellum. Perhaps they saw the possibility of the condemned man writing his confession or using the scribe or stylus as an impotent way to rage at his judges and jailers. Perhaps they saw the condemned man's writing of his sins and injuries, joys and losses of joy as all, an additional source of punishment. And perhaps in a certain way it was. But it was also my salvation. At first it saved me from the insanity and self-destruction of uncontrollable grief and remorse. Then it saved my memories of Aina. 
pulling them from the quagmire of horror at her terrible death to the firmer ground of our days together, her joy of living, her mission, our travels, and her complex but terribly straightforward message to me and all humankind. Eventually, it simply saved my life. Soon after beginning the narrative, I d discovered I could share the thoughts and actions of any of the participants in our long odyssey and failed struggle. I knew this was a function of what Aena had taught me through discussion and communication with learning the language of the dead and the language of the living. I still encountered the dead in my sleeping and waking dream. My mother often spoke to me and I tasted the agony and wisdom of uncounted others who had lived and died long ago. But it was not those lost souls who obsessed me now. It was, with, it was those with some parallel view of my own experiences in all my years of knowing Aena. So he's putting together a story and notice what he's saying there, parallel views and experiences. We get to see our own perspective, but there's the perspectives of everybody else by which the events, the experiences, the choices, the actions, the effects, they can change. They can reveal themselves as something different, something greater. That is what he is doing. He says, um, I, you know, I, I entered into at least some of the thoughts and motives of human beings so different from my own way of thinking as to be literally alien creatures, including those who, you know, went after him and uh, put him in the box and killed Aena. Uh, Cardinal Simon Augusto, Lord Osami and John Domenico Mustafa, Leonard Hoyt in his incarnations as Pope Julius and Pope Urban the, the 16th, mercantilist traders such as Kenzo Izozaki and Anna Peli Kogani, priests and warriors such as Father de Soya, Sergeant Gregorius, Captain Margaret Wu, and Executive Officer Hogan Liebler. Some of the characters in my tale are present in the void, which binds largely as scars, holes, vacancies. The Nemes creatures, these terrible AI Terminator types, are, uh, of, are such vacuums, as are Counselor Albedo and the other core entities. So he goes on, and he, he talks about all these different people, and he says... Although I know without doubt that Aina is dead, I never sought her voice among the chorus of those speaking the language of the dead. Rather, I felt her presence throughout the void which binds, felt her touch in the minds and hearts of the good people who wandered through our odyssey or had their lives changed forever in our long struggle with the Pax. And uh, he goes on and on. Um, and... Uh, he says, for a few wonderful days while writing the text, I convinced myself that Aena had returned from the dead, that some sort of miracle had been possible. I had just reached the part of my narrative where we had reached Old Earth, passing through the Farcaster on God's Grove after the terrible encounter with the first Nemesis thing, and had finished the section with a description of our arrival at Taliesin West. The night after finishing that first chunk of the story, I dreamed that Aena had come to me there in the Schrodinger death cell, had called my name in the dark, had touched my cheek, and whispered to me, We're leaving here, Raoul, my darling, not soon, but as soon as you finish your tale, as soon as you remember it all and understand it all. When I awoke, I'd found that the stylus scriber had been activated, and on its pages, in Aena's distinctive handwriting, was a long note from her, including some excerpts from her, her father's poetry. So he writes and writes and writes, and then eventually realizes exactly what was said here, that he can not just far cast, but use this ability that Aena had uh, developed uh, and was teaching other people to, to do it without a Farcaster portal. And he comes back to, you know, Old Earth uh, and to all these other places as well, to, to uh, the church world. And um, eventually he comes to meet Martin Salinas. And this is where the story effectively will end for us. But also, um, the cantos themselves are revealed as what they are. Martin Salinas was in good humor upon meeting his old friend, the uh, 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 man, Kassad, who will become the Shrike, right? And then Kassad says, did you ever finish your worthless prose poem? 
No, I said, speaking for the coughing form in the bed. He couldn't. This is Raoul Endemian. Yes, said Martin Salinas, clearly through his throat mic. I did. I just stood there. Actually, said the poet, he finished it for me. The bony arm with its wrapping of parchment flesh rose slightly from the bed. A thumb distorted by arthritis jerked in my attention. Colonel Cassad gave me a glance. I shook my head. Don't be so fucking dense, boy, said Martin Salinas with what translated as an affectionate tone over the speaker. See your scriber anywhere? I whirled and looked on the bedside tray where I'd left it earlier. It was gone. All printed out. About a billion backup memories cut. Sent it out on the datasphere before we cast here. There is no datasphere, I said. Martin Salinas laughed himself into a coughing fit. You aren't just dumb, boy. You are helpless. What do you think the void is? It's the goddamn universe's goddamn datasphere. Meaning sort of like the internet on steroids, right? I've been listening to it for centuries before the kid gave me communion to do it with nanotech bugs in me. That's what writers and artists and creators do, boy. Listen to the void and try to hear dead folks' thoughts. Feel their pain, the pain of living folks, too. Finding a muse is just an artist or holy man's way of getting a foot into the void which binds front door. Aina knew that. You should have, too. And then Raoul says, You had no right to transmit my narrative. It's mine. I wrote it. It's not part of your cantos. If I'd known for sure which tube passing him was his oxygen hose, I would have stepped on it till the rattling stopped. Bullshit, boy said Martin Salinas. Why do you think I sent you on this 11-year vacation? To rescue Aina, the poet cackled and coughed. She didn't need rescuing, Raoul. Hell, the way I saw it while it was happening, she pulled your worthless ass out of the fire more often than not. Even when the Shrike was doing the saving, it was only because that girl child had tamed it for a bit. The mummy's white eyes with their video pickup glasses turned towards Colonel Cassad. Tamed you, I mean, you once and future killing machine. I stepped away from the bed and touched one of the biomonitors to steady myself. Martin Salinius' voice called me back, almost taunting me. But you haven't finished it yet, boy. The cantos aren't done. I stared at him across the few cold distances, uh, meters of distance. What do you mean, old man? You've got to take me down there so we can finish it, Raoul, together. And that is what they do. And Salinas will die, his life work complete, Raoul's very story and the stories by extension of everybody else, all the other characters in this are what he writes and what goes into Dan Simmons's Hyperion Cantos. So it turns out that the Hyperion Cantos doesn't just name this set of four novels. And it doesn't just name a work within it that narrates what happened in the first two. It is also all of the events and more that were included in these. And you could think of it as perhaps we're even invited to become part of it through reading and imagination and empathy on our own part. Before launching into full-blown discussion of the philosophical themes and the cosmology and the development of the human race and all, all this other stuff, we should pause for a moment to talk about what happened with the characters who were introduced in Hyperion and who continued on through the fall of Hyperion. Some of them are indeed dead and remain dead, you know, Bron Lamia, the Council, uh, although the council's ship plays a significant role in this. And, you know, there's Martin Salinas, who's now at the end of his life in these later two books set almost three centuries uh, in, in the future to that. And, uh, you know, there's a few other characters. So Saul Weintraub is not himself going to come back, but his daughter, Rachel, who was aging backwards and given to the Shrike, by Saul uh, in, you know, these two books survives and turns out to be Moneta, who is the lover of Colonel Cassad, as he tells us in his story, before he has his epic battles with the Shrike. In fact, a whole bunch of Shrikes multiplied and, and eventually dies and is, you know, entombed in uh, the time tombs. Um, so, you know, those are some important characters. We also have 
uh, Het Manstein, who, you know, the true voice of the tree, the Templar, who we think is dead, but he's not either. And he is going to show up in these books as well, as we find that the Templars and the Ousters are in this incredibly rich, fertile alliance with each other that we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, the other two, of course, are the priests. And, you know, we get introduced to Leonard Hoyt, who is going to become the Pope, who is born again over and over and over again. And it is kind of a wicked character, is he not? Uh, but we also have Father Duray, the Jesuit follower of Teilhard de Chardin, who is, you know, connected with him through the cruciform parasite, as we'll talk about in a bit. But we want to think about one person in particular. And the reason we do is he's, you know, he's here on every single book. You see it in this, you see it in this, you see it in this. But now, interesting, he's riding a raft. And here he's, uh, you know, in a sort of protective stance. And that's the Shrike. In these first two books, the Shrike is at best something like a demon sent backwards in time. Nobody's quite sure exactly by whom maybe it's the AIs in the distant future when they've developed the ultimate intelligence, sending it back as a plague on humankind. And in these two books, the Shrike is confined to the world of Hyperion. That changes in these two books, where the Shrike helps out uh, Raoul and Demian, who's on this mission to save the young girl, the 12 year old Aina, coming out of the time tombs and then, you know, at other points in time as well. And the Shrike now acts as a helper. A helper who kills people, of course, and who destroys the Pax forces, going from person to person, charring them, eating them up, you know, impaling them, all, all the things that the Shrike tends to do. The Shrike also will jump from ship to ship to ship and kill people on those. And then the Shrike, interestingly enough, is going to be resisting, fighting, trying to destroy these particular AIs who've been sent by the Technocore. Uh, Nemes is a, a you know, prime example of this. She's the first one introduced, then she's got her siblings. And they're essentially like Terminator robots, except imagine the Terminator if it was truly almost invulnerable and had all of these tools at its disposal and could move faster than any human being. The Shrike is the creature that can actually resist them. And what do we find out about the Shrike? The Shrike, in a certain way, did kill Colonel Kassad because Colonel Kassad became the Shrike. Colonel Kassad is the, you know, might say, ultimate human warrior and he is turned into this, whatever you want to call it, demon, uh, avatar of war, helper, not quite robot, cyborg perhaps, sent back to aid and to do all of these things. So ironically, the guy who saw the Shrike as like this, I fought in all these wars and Moneta has been with me, you know, fighting, copulating with me. Uh, we're this, this great, you know, warrior pair. Um, the Shrike is the ultimate enemy, but the Shrike is himself. So that's a very interesting sideline for philosophical themes that I just didn't want to leave out for anybody who perhaps has read these two but hasn't gotten into these, and for anybody who's gotten into these uh, last two books of the series, you know that this is quite an important plot point, we might say. The fate of humanity, where humanity is going, is an incredibly important theme in these works in the entire Hyperion Cantos. And we could say that there are a number of important factions trying to determine things. 
And we also have, you know, many, many vignettes of people who just want to live their lives, who have their own projects that they're engaged in, sometimes just attempting to survive and live their way of life together. But we also have the church, the Catholic church, in a very corrupt form, and the Pax Mercantilius, which work essentially hand in hand with each other, with the church ruling over the Pax. And so that is the, you could say, the inheritor of one mode of humanity that was around with the hegemony before the fall, the fall of the Farcaster network and the breakdown of humans you know, into each of their own little private worlds. There are other religions out there. There is, you know, the Church of the Final Atonement that has to do with the Shrike. There are the Templars who have now left and gone to join the Ousters with whom they were in league the entire time. There are practicing Jews, there are Muslims, there are Hindus, there are Buddhists, there are all sorts of other people as well. But the church is the one that has become dominant throughout the system. And we, we get to see them through a lot of different vignettes. We're introduced to a new character um, very early on, the second main character, you could say. Uh, not Raul and Demian, but the guy who is, um, a you could call them a um, third-person centric character. We learn about uh, Father Captain de Soya, right? And he is being tasked with a job that is really quite bizarre and given this index of papal authority that allows him to countermand just about anybody's orders. He's also going to be uh, given a ship which causes him um, every time that he uses it to go from system to system, to die. And then he has to be resurrected, right? So, um, you know, there's some interesting discussions of that. We've already brought up this, you know, earlier passage about Hoyt and DeRay and all that. Uh, you know, Father Captain Federico de Soya is, is actually watching the Pope and then... Father Baggio had explained the overwhelming sense of newness and wonder that was the after effect of holy resurrection. The church has turned resurrection into another sacrament by use of this cruciform parasite that has been discovered all over the place and which is sort of like a, a blessing, right? Anybody who is in good graces with the church can accept the cruciform and when they die, they can be resurrected. So uh, Father Baggio says... The essential feeling of well-being would always linger, growing stronger with each rebirth in Christ. De Soya could see why the church held suicide as one of its most mortal sins, punishable by immediate excommunication, since the glow to nearness to God was so much stronger after tasting the ashes of death. Resurrection could easily become addictive if the punishment for suicide were not so terrible. Still aching from the pain of death and rebirth, his mind and senses literally lurching from vertigo, Father Captain de Soya watches the papal mass approach the climax of communion, and it goes on and on, right? And uh, they, they assign him this, this job, essentially, to track down and bring back to the Vatican this girl, Aena, who is explained as being something kind of like a, a demon in some respects, right? So um, they tell him about this. Uh, the child is the daughter of a woman named Braun, Lamia, says Admiral uh, Marosin. Does the name mean anything to you, Father? It does, but for a moment, DeSoya cannot think why. Then the verses of the cantos come to mind, and he remembers the female pilgrim in the story. And Cardinal Lourdes Sami says, Braun Lamia had sexual intercourse with an abomination, a cybrid, a cloned human construct whose mind was an artificial intelligence residing in the techno core. Do you remember the history in the band poem? And, uh, he, you know, he, he tells him, you know, that uh, the woman in the blasphemous poem, Braun Lamia, not only had intercourse with the cybrid abomination, but she bore the creature's child. And this is the result, Aina, right? She was not 
fully human, whispers Cardinal Lursani. Although the body of her father, the Keats hybrid, was destroyed, his AI persona was stored in a shrewd loop shunt. Right? We're almost certain that this fetus was in touch with the Technocore via that cybrid persona. So the Technocore is evil, right? And you know the church is protecting humanity against it after the, the great debacle of the fall. That's what DeSoya thinks so far. And he gets his uh, crew, um, Corporal Basin Key, Lancer uh, uh, Reddig, and... Um, Sergeant Gregorius, and all four of them uh, have to travel on this ship. All four of the men are shaken by the experience of death. DeSoya tries to convince them it gets easier with experience, but his own shaken body and wits put the lie to these reassurances. Here, without counseling and therapy and the welcoming resurrection chaplains, each of the pack soldiers is dealing with the trauma as best he can, the trauma of resurrection, the trauma of dying and being brought back to life, right? And so they go on their their mission. Um, there, we jump forward quite a bit, and there is an interesting discussion that's happening about the, uh, uh, again, Father de Soya and Cardinal Lurasami, right? So Lourdes Sami tells uh, De Soya that this abomination will destroy all that. As I said to you one year ago, this is not a child we seek. It is a virus. And we know now whence that virus comes. De Soya listens. His Holiness had one of his visions. You are aware, Frederico, the Holy Father is often visited by dreams granted by God. And he goes on and he says... Um, it was one of those sacred revel revelations which prompted the Holy Father to ask for you in this service, Federico. He saw that your fate and the salvation of our church and society were inextricably intertwined. And now the threat to the future of humankind has been revealed in much greater detail. What is it? This is, indeed, the AI Technocore's great attempt at our destruction, Federico. The same mechanical evil which destroyed old Earth, which preyed on humanity's minds and souls through their parasitic farcasters, which prompted the ouster attack that presaged the fall. This same evil is at work here. The cybrid offspring, this Aina, is their instrument. This is why the farcasters have worked for her when they admit no one else. This is why the Shrike demon slayed thousands of our people and soon may slay millions, perhaps billions, Billions, unless stop this succubus will succeed in returning us to the rule of the machine. Lord Asami stops his pacing, but his holiness now knows that this cybrid spawn is not only the agent of the core, she is the instrument of the machine god. DeSoya understands. When the Inquisition had queried him about the cantos, his insides had turned to jelly at the thought of punishment for having read the banned poem, but... This work on the index admitted that the elements of the AI core had been working for centuries to produce an ultimate intelligence, a cybernetic deity that would spread its power back through time to dominate the universe. Indeed, both the Cantos and official church history acknowledge the battle across time between this false god and our Lord, the, he the Keats Cybrid, Cybrids actually, since there had been a replacement, had falsely represented as a candidate for the Messiah of the human UI. That's blasphemous Tyardian concept of an evolved human god in the, in the prohibited cantos. The poem had talked about empathy as being the key to human spiritual evolution. The church had corrected that, pointing out that obeying God's will was the source of revelation and salvation. Now, what do we actually discover? Um... All of this is a lie. The church has been in cahoots with the Technocore all this time. And interestingly, the ousters had never engaged in any attack on the, uh, the PAX or originally uh, the church as it was arising or the hegemony. Now, um, Lord Asami also tells him as well, I must reveal something to you at this moment, Federico, which billions of the faithful will not learn for months. Today, this hour, at the interstellar Synod of Bishops, His Holiness is announcing a crusade. 
a crusade against the ouster menace. For centuries, we have defended ourselves. The Great Wall is a defensive stratagem, putting Christian bodies and ships in lives in the way of the ouster aggression. But as of this day, by the grace of God, the church and Pax will go on the offensive. Uh, each world is being asked, commanded to devote planetary resources to build one great ship, one for each world. And they are using this archangel technology, which translates them almost immediately to where they're going, killing the human beings in the process, and then they are resurrected, and then they begin to fight. Now, we learn more as this book proceeds. Uh, if we move away from, you know, Father to Soya, who, by the way, is going to have a very important crisis of conscience and at the end of this book and uh, try to destroy the nemesis our AI construct, and then he's going to actually uh, switch sides and use his archangel ship in this to try to um, change the course of the battle as all the pack ships are going after Aina. Let's put that aside for a moment. So Aina and Bedek and uh, uh, Raul and Demian are talking with each other and with Father Glaucus on this ice world. And uh, Raul says, um, or, uh, uh, actually, here we go. Aina says, it's not the Shrike chasing us, you know, nor the Pax. Of course it's the Pax, I said, trying to get her to make contact with reality. They've been after us since. Aina was shaking her head adamantly. No, the Pax is after us because the core tells it we're very dangerous to them. The core, I said, but it's ever since the fall, it's been, Aina says, alive and dangerous. After Gladstone and the others destroyed the Farcaster system that provided the core with its neural net, it, it retreated, but it never went far. Raul, can't you see that? The Pax, uh, the girl said simply, my father, his persona, and mother's shrone loop explained it to me before I was born. The core waited until the church began being revitalized under Paul Duray, Pope Teilhard the First. Duray was a good man, Raoul. My mother and Uncle Martin knew him. He carried two cruciforms, his own and Father Leonard Hoyt's. But Hoyt was weak. Listen, anything can happen tomorrow on God's Grove. She says, I can die, we can all die. Um, and then she says, just listen. Teilhard was murdered in his ninth year. My father predicted it. I don't know if it was by Technocore agents, they used cybrids, or just Vatican politics. But when Lenar Hoyt was resurrected from their shared cruciforms, the core acted. The, it was the core that provided the technology of allowing the cruciform to revive humans without the sexlessness or idiocy visited upon the Bikura tribe in Hyperion. But how, I said, how could the Technocore AIs know how to tame the cruciform symbiote? I saw the answer even before she spoke. They created the cruciforms, not the current core, but the UI they create in the future. It sent the things back in time on Hyperion, just as it did in the time tombs, tested the parasites on the lost tribe, saw the problems, little problems like resurrection, destroying reproductive organs and intelligence. Yes, said Aina, she took my hand again. The core was able to correct their problems with their technology, technology they gave to the church under its new Pope, Leonard Hoyt, Julius the Sixth. I began to understand. A Faustian bargain, I said. The Faustian bargain, the girl said. All the church had to do to gain the universe was sell its soul. And thus the Pax Protector was born, a Abedic said softly, political power coming through the barrel of a parasite. It's the core that's after me, uh, after us, continued the child. I'm a threat to them, not just to the church. I shook my head slowly. How are you a threat to the core? You're one child. One child who was in touch with a renegade, renegade cybrid persona before I was born, she whispered. My father was loose, Raoul, not just in the data sphere or the megasphere, but in the metasphere, loose in the wider psycho carbonet that even the core was terrified of. Bedek mumbles, lions and tigers and bears. And we're going to come back to that in just a bit. Uh, so I'm going to leave off there. We do need to say a few more things about what, what is revealed to us about the AIs, the Technocore, and the church in the next book. So 
what we find is um, that Umon, this is uh, Reina telling Raul about this. Did you know about the major error in Uncle Martin's cantos, Raul? No, I said. Um, it was twofold. Somewhere in the desert, Nidahawk called. First, he believed what the Technocore told my father, meaning the, the Keats cybrid, about, the one, about how they were the ones who had hijacked Earth, about everything. Umon was lying to the John Keats cybrid. Why? They were just planning to destroy it. The girl looked at me, but my mother was there to record the conversation, and the core knew she would tell the old poet. I nodded slowly, and that he would put it as a fact in the poem he was writing, but why would they want to lie about? His second mistake was more subtle and serious. Uncle Martin believed that the Technocore was humanity's enemy, she continued. Why? Is that a mistake? Aren't they our enemy? When the girl did not answer, I held up my hand, five figures splayed. One, according to the Cantos, the core was the real force behind the attack on the hegemony that led to the fall of the Farcasters, not the ousters, the core. The church has denied that, made the ousters responsible. Are you saying that the church is right and the old poet was wrong? No, said Aina. It was the core that orchestrated the attack. Billions dead. The hegemony toppled. The web destroyed. The fat line cut. The techno core did not cut the fat line, she said softly. All right, taking a breath. That was some mysterious entity, your lions and tigers and bears, but it was still the core behind the attack. Second, did or did not the Technocore use the Farcasters as some sort of cosmic leech to suck up human neural networks for their damned ultimate intelligence project? Every time someone Farcast, they were being used by those autonomous intelligences. Correct, said Aina. Three, the poem has Rachel, the pilgrim Saul Weintraub's child who comes backward in the time tombs, tell about a time to come when the final war raged between the core spawned UI and the human spirit. Was this a mistake? No, said Aina. Four, I beginning to feel a little bit foolish. Didn't the core admit to your father it created him, created the John Keats cybrid just as a trap for, what did they call it, the empathy component of the human ultimate intelligence that's supposed to come into existence sometime in the future? That's what they said, said Aina. Five, wasn't it the core as well as the packs? Hell, the core ordering the packs that tried to have you caught uh, uh, and... Uh, killed on Hyperion, on Renaissance Vector, on God's Grove, halfway across the spiral arm? Yes, she said softly. And wasn't it the core that created that female thing that arranged to have poor a Bedek's arm sliced off on God's Grove and would have had your head in a bag if it hadn't been for the Shrike's intervention? Wasn't it the fucking core that's been trying to kill me as well as you and will probably kill us if we're ever stupid enough to go into pack space? Aina nodded. But if all these facts are true, I shook my head. And here we get the big, important shift. Elements of the core attack the web before the fall. We know from my father's visit with Uman that the core was not in agreement about many of its decisions. They used our neural networks for their UI project, but there's no evidence it did humans any harm. Right? And she says... Um, the group of AIs called the Ultimates have created problems for humanity in the past and will in the future, including trying to kill you and me, but they're only part of the core. I shook my head. I don't understand. Are you really saying there are good AIs and bad AIs? Don't you remember they actually considered destroying the human race and they may still do it? Aina said, uh, touched my knee again. Don't forget, Raul, that humanity has also come close to destroying the human race. Capitalists and communists were ready to blow up Earth when that was the only planet we lived on. And the church is ready to destroy the ousters, even as we speak genocide on a scale our race has never seen before. The church and a lot of others don't consider the ousters human beings, I said. Nonsense snapped Aina. Of course they are. They evolved from common human or earth human, human origins, just as the AI Technocore did. All three races are orphans in the storm. All three races, I repeated. Christ, are you including the core in your definition of humanity? We created them, she said softly. Early on, we used human DNA to increase their computing power. And she goes on and says um, that here we go. Do you remember what the AI Uman said to the second seat's Keats Cybrid? 
um, and there, there's a repetition of this. Empathy was supposedly the fleeing component of the human AI, UI, part of our evolved human consciousness in the future come back in time. The hybrid was the John Keats hybrid, I continued, son of man and machine. No, said Ana softly. That was Uncle Martin's second misunderstanding. The Keats hybrids were not created to be the refuge for empathy in this age. They were created to be the instrument of that fusion between core and humankind to have a child, in other words. She is that child, right? And that is why those elements of the core working through the church are trying to kill her, right? And the, the you know, there's a lot in here that I'm going to kind of skip over that shows the dependency of the both the PACs and the church on the uh, techno core. Uh, there's another discussion a little bit later on, um, which is very interesting. Actually, I'm not going to try to read this because I want to save a little bit of time. Lifeless human bodies are taken from all these worlds where the church is not the dominant religion, but other people. Seven billion bodies transported by these two religious orders, Opus Dei, which exists in our time, and Cor Unum, right? And these are all um, being put into this kind of spell by the Techno Core, which is going to be using them later on. Um, and then, you know, there's a very interesting discussion shortly after this with the counselor Albedo the, of the Technocore who came into, you know, our purview in these two books, engaging with um, this uh, uh, Pax uh, person. And he tells uh, Izozaki that the Technocore was never grouped into three warring elements. The core from its evolution into consciousness a thousand years ago, was made up of thousands of distinct elements and factions, often warring, moreover, co more often cooperating, but always struggling to achieve a synthesis of agreement towards the direction autonomous intelligence and artificial life should evolve. That agreement has never crystallized. About the same time that the Technocore was evolving into true autonomy, while most humankind lived on the surface of and near orbit around one world, humanity had developed the capacity to change its own genetic programming. They do this uh, through not just genetic manipulation, but nanotechnology, right? Um, and what we find is this is where the ousters come from. Elements of the emergent core, which favored alliance with the nanotech universes, discovered something that terrified all elements of the core. What would that be? Um, as you know, our early research into Hawking drive physics and faster than light communication led to the Planck space medium, what some have called the void, which binds. Evolving knowledge about this underlying and unifying structure to the universe led to our creation of the faster than light communication, the so-called fat line, as well as to the refined Hawking drive, the far casters that united the hege hegemonic world web, the planetary data spheres evolving into megaspheres of core directed data, today's instantaneous Gideon drive, and even experiments into anti-entropic bubbles within the universe, what we believe the time tubes will become on Hyperion. But these gifts to humanity were not without a price, he goes on, talking about the neural nets and the exploitation of human beings. And, you know, he goes on as well, giving more and more background, and then finally reveals to him that the elements of the core, under a guise of an ouster attack, launched a final physical assault, assault on the world web, despairing of destroying the scattered human race in one stroke. They hope to destroy the advanced world web society. Um, and this led to, you know, the breakdown of that. Uh, other elements of the core, elements to, devoted to pre not only preserving the human race, but some sort of alliance, destroyed one iteration of the John Keats hybrid, but a second was created and succeeded in his primary mission. And so here's a revelation of what was going on with uh, Aena. He also tells him about the crucifix. The origins of the cruciform lie shrouded in mystery, but we humanist elements of the core believe it was developed in our future and brought back through time via the Hyperion time tombs. The failure of the symbiote was due to the simple demands of information storage and retrieval. In a human mind, there are neurons. In a human body, there are approximately 10 to the 28th power 
atoms. The cruciform, in order to restore the mind and body of a human being, must not only keep track of these atoms and neurons, but remember the precise configuration of the standing holistic wavefront, which comprises the human memory and personality. It must provide the energy to restructure these atoms, molecules, bones, muscles, and memories so the organism is reborn. Right? The cruciform alone cannot do that successfully. At best, the bio-machine can reproduce a crude copy of the original. But the core had the computing power to store, retrieve, reshape, and reform this information into a human being, and we have done so for three centuries. So the core has been behind this cruciform that offers resurrection to human beings all of the time. Now, towards the very end of the book, when Aina is being uh, tortured to death in front of Raoul um, by Counselor Albedo and uh, uh, the various cardinals and things like that, we get one more interesting uh, revelation. They want her to far cast, to free cast out of there so that they can essentially reverse engineer it and get even more power, right? They would hurt her, as he says, until she could not stand it any longer. And when she cast away, the core instruments would measure everything to the billionth of a nanosecond, analyze her use of the void, and come up with a way to replicate it. The core would finally have their far casters back, not in their crude wormhole or Gideon Drive manner, but an instant and elegant and eternally theirs. Now, we get a final interesting revelation here. Aina says to Counselor Albedo, I know where you live. The handsome gray man's mouth twitched. What do you mean? I know where the core, the physical elements of the core are. Nonsense, he said. No human being has ever known the location of the core. In the beginning, the core was a transient entity floating in the crude data sphere on old earth known as the internet. Then even before the Hajira, you moved your bubble memories and servers and core storage nexus to a cluster of asteroids in long orbit around the sun, far from the old Earth you planned to destroy. During the days of the hegemony, continued Aena, the core decided it was prudent to diversify the physical core components, the bubble memory matrices deep underground and the nine labyrinthine worlds, fat line servers and the orbital industrial complexes around Tau Ceti Center, core entity persona traveling along Farcaster combands, and the megasphere connecting it all laced through the Farcaster rifts in the void which binds. But after the fall, the core got worried. Mana Gladstone's attack on the Farcaster medium gave you pause, even if the damage to your megasphere was repairable. You decided to diversify further, multiply your personae, miniaturize essential core memories, and make your parasiticism on the human neural networks more direct. What actually is going on here? You wanted your neural parasiticism to be more direct, so your billions of core entities each formed its surrounding matrix in cruciform shape and attached themselves directly to your human host. Every one of your core individuals now has a human host of its own to live in and destroy at will. You remain connected via the old data spheres and new Gideon Drive megasphere nodes, but you enjoy dwelling so close to your food source. So the cruciforms are not just a gift from the core to human beings, not just a way in which the core has been infiltrating things through a church, it's a direct form of parasitism upon the human race involved through something that appears to be life-giving. So that's uh, you know, giving you some background, some interesting information about what's happening with these key things, the artificial intelligences or autonomous, autonomous intelligences, the, the technocore, the church, the Pax, human beings. We could talk about the ousters. We're probably not going to have too much time to discuss them. They are uh, adopting a different perspective on humanity and the cosmos. Now it's time, though, that we talk about the void that binds and Aena's role in revealing what it truly is to us human beings. 
This video has already grown a little bit over long, but I crave your indulgence because we have to go into the last great philosophical theme that is running throughout the entire series, but really becoming massively important in these last two books of the Hyperion Cantos. And that is, what is the void which binds? Now, that is centrally important, but we also can't talk about that without talking about the lions and tigers and bears, the other entities, and the one who teaches, Aina, one of the main characters of this entire uh, second two-part novel that brings everything to a close, the Messiah, the Savior, the Teacher, the lover of Raoul and Damian, the really you know most important character in the entire thing, because all of these are connected together. So we get a few things coming up in Endemian. Um, she is talking with uh, Raoul about the Farcasters and um, the fall and all of that. And now this is some great foreshadowing. She tells us that the uh, megasphere, the data spheres, the farcaster medium, uh, you know, were, were important. And then Raul says the farcaster medium, that void thing, linked data spheres, right? The force and the hegemony, electronic government, the all thing. They all use the megasphere as well as the fat line to stay connected. And then Ana says, yeah, the megasphere actually existed on a subplane of the fat line. I didn't know that I said the FTL medium had not existed in my lifetime. And then she says, do you remember what the last message on the fat line, this instantaneous communication network was before it went down during the fall? Yes, I said, closing my eyes. The lines of the poem did not come to me this time. The ending of the cantos had always been too vague to interest me enough to memorize all these stanzas, despite Grandem's drilling. Some cryptic message from the core, I said. Something about get off the line and quit tying it up. So Aina says, the message was this. There will be no further misuse of this channel. You are disturbing others who are using it to serious purpose. Access will be restored when you understand what it is for. Right, I said, that's in the cantos, I think. And then the hyperstring medium just quit working. The core sent that message and shut down the fat line. Then Ayanna has a revelation. The core did not send that message. It didn't, I said stupidly. Who did? Good question said the child. When my father talked about the metasphere, the wider datum plane that was somehow connected to or by the void which binds, he always used to say it was filled with lions and tigers and bears. Lions and tigers and bears, I repeated. These were old earth animals. I didn't think any of them made the hegira. I didn't think any of them were around to make the trip, not even their stored DNA. Hmm, I said Aina. I'd like to meet them someday. Here we are. And they will, in fact, by the end, meet the lions and tigers and bears, the others who use the void which binds. A little bit later in this work, uh, she brings that up again. And um, she talks about, well, Raul asks, how are you a threat to the core, your one child? And she says, one child who was in touch with a renegade cybrid persona before I was born. My father was loose, Raoul, not just in the datasphere or the megasphere, but in the metasphere. Loose in the wider psycho cerebinet that even the core was terrified of. Lions and tigers and bears, muttered a betic. Exactly, said Aina. You know, when my father's persona penetrated the core megasphere, he asked the AI Umon what the core was afraid of. They said they didn't range further in the metasphere because it was full of lions and tigers and bears. I don't get it, kiddo. I said, I'm lost. So they, they go on and start talking about old earth and all of that. Interestingly, I'm going to reveal a little bit. Abetic is one of those lions and tigers and bears. He has been there to observe what humanity and the Technocore are doing. Um, now, Aina is massively important. She's not just this juncture point between the techno core and humanity. She is also somebody who is in a certain way in touch with the void which binds in a way 
that is at that point unique to her. Although we find out in the story that she's already given communion in this to one other person, Uncle Salinas, years and years before, and he is ready to do it. Now, what, what is this communion? It's actually a, a, you know, a genetic component in her body, which can be transferred by partaking in her blood. And it changes human beings fundamentally. How so? Well, she tells us about this virus, right? Um, and it's connected to, you know, love being uh, a basic force of the universe. And, and uh, Raul says, you talked about teaching the physics of love, understanding love as a basic force of the universe. Is that the virus? And she says, that's the source of the virus. What I teach is how to use that energy. How, I whispered. Aina says, let's say there's four steps, four stages, four levels. This is absolutely centrally important. The first is learning the language of the dead, she said. And then you know, Raul tries to interrupt her and she says, shh. The second is learning the language of the living. I nodded, not understanding either phrase. The third is, under, is hearing the music of the spheres, she whispered. In my reading at Telesian West, I'd run across this ancient phrase. It was all mixed up with astrology, the pre-scientific age on old earth, Kepler's little wooden models of a solar system, on and on, volumes of double talk. I had no idea what my friend was talking about and how it could apply to an age when humanity moved faster than light through the spiral arm of the galaxy. The fourth step, her gaze turned inward again, is learning to take the first step. Now, what, what is all this? What, what's going on with this? So the language of the dead, the dead are not completely gone. They are there in the void which binds. The language of the living, being able to see things from the perspective of those existing in the present time, the music of the spheres is literally understanding the universe and not just a cognitive understanding, but a grasp that is also affective. The first step is being able to free cast, to move instantaneously across vast distances uh, using the void which binds, sort of like the farcasters did, but it's revealed that the farcasters are actually free casting not the other way around. Now, a little bit later, um, and we get these great teaching sessions going on. Um, she is going to talk about the um, void which binds again. And she tells us this. The void which binds is a multidimensional medium with its own reality, and as the core was soon to learn, its own topography. The Hawking drive was not and is not a drive at all in the classic sense, but an entry device which touches on Planck space topography just long enough to change coordinates in the four-dimensional space-time continuum. Farcaster portals, on the other hand, allow actual entry to the void which binds medium to humans, the reality was obvious. Step through a hole in space-time here, exit instantaneously via another Farcaster hole there. My Uncle Martin had a Farcaster home with adjoining rooms on dozens of worlds. Farcasters created the Hegemony's world web, the precursor before the fall. All these worlds were interconnected by the Farcasters, which were given to them by the Technocore, right? The core did not perfect the Hawking drive, the Farcaster, and the fat line for human convenience. Indeed, the core never perfected anything in their dealings with the, with the void which binds. The core knew from the beginning the Hawking drive was little more than a failed attempt to enter Planck space. Driving spacecraft via Hawking drive was comparable, they knew, to moving an ocean-going vessel by setting off a series of explosions at its stern and riding the waves crudely effective, wildly inefficient. And uh, she goes on, she says, they knew despite all appearances to the contrary, there were not millions of Farcaster portals, only one. All Farcaster portals were actually a single entry door to Planck space, manipulated across space time to provide the functioning illusion of so many doors. If the court attempted to explain the truth to humanity, they might have used the analogy of a flashlight beam being rapidly flashed around a closed room. There were not many sources of light, only one in rapid transition 
but they never bothered to explain this. In truth, they've kept the secret to the day. She goes on and she says, the, what the core realized in their earliest experiments was that the void which binds was the perfect medium for their own existence. It would give them a hiding place, which was at once nowhere and everywhere, a hiding place from humanity who might want to turn them off. But then they discovered it's not empty, right? Behind its metadimensional hills and deep in its foldum quantum space arroyos lurked Something different, someone different. There were intelligences there. The core probed, then recoiled in awe and terror of the potential power of these others. These were the lions and tigers and bears spoken of by Uman. The core's retreat had been so hasty, its reconnaissance so incomplete, it had no idea where in real time and space these lions and tigers and bears dwelt, or if they existed in real time at all, nor could the core AIs identify the others as having evolved from organic life as humanity had done or from artificial life as they had. So the core, with its many, many factions, is terrified of what it discovers and it keeps this from humanity and it argues about it with themselves. Such power was beyond comprehension. The core's reaction was pure panic and immediate retreat. This discovery and panic happened just as the core had in initiated the actions of destroying old earth. And the home planet then disappeared. Not destroyed as it seemed to the humans, not saved as the core had hoped, just gone. The core knew that the lions and tigers and bears had to be the ones who took the earth, but as to how and to where, for what reason, they had no clue. They computed the amount of energy necessary to far cast an entire planet away and again began quaking in their hyper-life boots. Such intelligences could explode the core of an entire galaxy to use as an energy source as easily as humans could light a campfire on a cold knife. night. The core entities shit hyper-life bricks in their fear. And so the core, you know, creates cybrids to try to understand things. She also explains that there are not three camps in the techno core. There are billions. The core is the ultimate exercise in anarchy, hyper parasitism uh, carried to its highest power. Core elements vie for power in alliances, which might last centuries or microseconds. Billions of the parasitic personae ebb and flow in unholy alliances built to control or to predict events. And she tells us that a faction called the Reapers are actually the largest block, greater block than the Ultimates. And it was that the Reapers who created and first controlled the physical construct known as the Shrike. Now going on a little bit further, that's probably enough about the core at this point. What about the void which binds? So she's asked, about this when she's teaching on the, the, you know, essentially Buddhist planet. Someone says, tell us about the void which binds. And here we get sort of a great revelation. Once upon a time, there was the void and the void was beyond time. In a real sense, the void was an orphan of time and an orphan of space. But the void was not of time, not of space, and certainly was not of God, nor is the void which binds God. In truth, the void evolved long after space and time had staked out the limits to the universe, but unbound by time, untethered in space, the void which binds has leaked backward and forward across the continuum to the Big Bang, Bang beginning and the little whimper end of things. Then she goes on and she says, the void which binds is a minded thing. It comes from minded things, many of whom were in turn created by minded things. The void which binds is stitch of quantum stuff, woven with Planck space, Planck time, lying under and around space time like a quilt cover around and under cotton batting. The void which binds, this is very, very important, is neither mystical nor metaphysical. It flows from and responds to the physical laws of the universe, but it is a product of that evolving universe. I'm going to pause here for a second because at another point in this book, Aina says evolution itself evolves, right? So it's not a fixed set of laws. There's actually a complicated 
growing more to evolution itself and the void which binds is uh, clearly connected with that. So she says that the void is structured from thought and feeling. It is an artifact of the universe's consciousness of itself and not merely of human thought and feeling. The void which binds is a composite of a hundred thousand sentient races across billions of years of time. It is the only constant in the evolution of the universe, the only common ground for races that will evolve, grow, flower, fade, and die millions of years and hundreds of millions of light years apart from each other. And there is only one entrance key to the void which binds. So what we have here is an incredible revelation about this, right? It is something that pervades everything and it is itself sentient and the locus of sentience. And this is where we can do the things that Aina was talking about. Learn the language of the dead. Uh, learn the language of the living, you know. Uh, hear the language of the spheres and step, make that first step into the void which binds. Now, she shares how this becomes possible for human beings in this communion with the void which binds. And she tells the ones who are going to partake of it, before you partake of this, I must remind you, this is a physical change, not a spiritual one. Your individual quest for God or enlightenment must remain just that. Your individual quest, this moment of change will not bring satori or salvation. It will bring only change. And she tells how this works. In the cells of my blood are unique DNA and RNA arrangements along with certain viral agents which will invade your body, starting through the digestive linings of your stomachs and ending in every cell of your body. These invasive viruses are somatic. That is, they will be passed along to your children. These physical changes will allow you, after some training, to touch the void which binds more directly, thus learning the language of the dead and of the living. Eventually, with much more experience and training, it may be possible for you to hear the music of the spheres and take a true step elsewhere. And she says, this is not metaphysics. This is a mutant viral agent. And so this communion will not offer you immortality. It ensures that death will be our common end. Right? I do not offer you eternal life or instant satori. If these are the things you seek most dearly, you must find them in your own religious searchings. I offer you only a deepening of the human experience of life and connection to others, human or not, who have shared that commitment to living. So she says as well that there is duty, discomfort, and great danger who partake of this and in doing so become teachers of the, themselves of the void which binds as well as fellow carriers of this new virus of human choice. So what she's offering is a physical change that will open up new possibilities for those human beings to partake in a universe that is much richer than we had suspected. Um, it, I'm going to skip over this, this passage here. It's enough to say that the core had been rending the void which binds and also destroying some of the personalities that were stored there, the voices of the dead, and doing great damage to them, uh, not understanding what it was, it was engaged in. A little bit later, uh, towards the end, she talks about love, and she says... Remember our discussion long ago about the physics of love? And Raul says, love is an emotion, kiddo, not a form of energy. And she says, it's both, Raul, it truly is. And it's the only key to unlocking the universe's greatest supply of energy. And he says, are you talking about religion? And she says, no, no, I'm not talking about religion. And I'm talking about physics, an engineering project two and a half billion years old and barely begun. And then the last passage that I'll bring up is when he's about ready to free cast himself. And he's, he's in the um, Schrodinger cage. And he says, Aina heard the music of the spheres. She resonated with the void which binds, which resonates in turn to sentient life and thought. And she used the almost illimitable energy of the void to take the first step to travel the void to where those voices 
waited. She'd once said the void tapped into the energy of quasars, the exploding centers of galaxies, black holes and black matter. Love was the prime mover in the universe, Aina had once said to me. I saw now what she had meant and how it worked. Much of the music of the spheres was created by the elegant harmonies and the chord changes of love. Free casting to where one's loved one waits, learning a place after having traveled there with the one or ones you love, loving to see new places. And he says, suddenly I understood why our first months together had been what had seemed at the time like useless wanderings from world to world. We had been learning how to love them. Aina had swept Abedic and me with the, to these places, touching them, sniffing their air, feeling their sunlight on her skin, seeing them all with friends, with someone she loved, learning the music of the spheres so that it could be played later. So this is the vision that Simmons is offering us as the culmination of this massive Hyperion Cantos. Adventure story, space opera, metaphysical meditations. It all comes down to love, and not in a reductive way, but as the key that opens up the entirety of the universe beyond what we see, hear, feel, sense to a greater possible communion with the totality of intelligent beings. What a vision to end on. And that is where we will end this long discussion of this second half of Dan Simmons' Hyperion Campus.